Okay, it looks like we're about to get started. Um, good evening and welcome. Thanks all of you who are joining us for joining us for another in our series of webinars and Green Wave programs. I'm Holly Hart, co-chair of the National Green Party Coordinated Campaign Committee. And before we get to our program tonight, just a bit about the Coordinated Campaign Committee, which is called the CCC and the series. The Coordinated Campaign Committee uh, cooperates with state and local Green Party chapters around the country. We support candidates at all levels, state, local, federal, Green Party electoral campaigns through a variety of different programs and support functions. We track Green Party candidates at all levels of government, and we offer training materials in support for Green Party candidates and activities. Our mission is to help recruit candidates and office holders. We run cam or uh, support campaigns and Greens elected to public office. Uh, and we'll be hearing more about some of those Greens tonight in just a little bit. Our committee is comprised of 10 elected members and then we have a system of liaisons, at least one for each state party to help uh, tr keep track of things and the volunteer as needed and as people are interested. We have a number of resources. Uh, and if you go to gpus.org backslash committees, you can find the Coordinated Campaign Committee. And on that page, you can find a link to uh, documents. We have a number of documents, including a campaign manual, campaign in a box, and some legacy documents that go back quite a ways, but they're oldies but goodies. Still some good relevant material in there for anybody wanting to run a real grassroots green campaign. And we also have another link to webinars. We have a series of webinars uh, dealing with various aspects of running campaigns some raw video, some audio and slide decks uh, going back a few years again, but again, uh, some good and some expert, real expert material. Our campaign schools, uh, we offer workshops at the annual national meetings and some in-person uh, campaign schools when invited and recently virtual campaign schools, some of which we have online. We have a series of webinars, usually on the second Tuesdays of the month, which cover various aspects of campaigns, how to get started, what is a green campaign, treasury and fundraising, media, getting out the vote, outreach, debriefing your campaign after it's all over. And we also highlight Greens who are elected to public office. And again, we're going to hear from some of them tonight. Uh, so this is our first webinar of the year, and we're going to feature elected Greens as partly a uh, means of recruiting more Greens to run for office. Our next webinar, which is the second Tuesday in February, will be So You Want to Run for Office or Kids, Try This at Home. Uh, it's campaign basics, and if you're thinking of running for office or on the fence or just want to know more, you can check that out. To find out more about our committee and resources and to be put on our webinar mailing list, you can email ccc at gp.org. That's ccc at gp.org. So I'll move on. Tonight's host is himself a recent office holder, Dave Akmanowitz from Quakertown, Pennsylvania, where he has served on the school board. He'll be introducing tonight's guest. Welcome, David, and you can take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. <clears throat> you know, the, the Coordinated Campaign Committee is a really, really excellent committee. Uh, you know, so grateful you guys are there. You provide such critical organizing tools to, to the whole party all the time. I mean, you know, I'm so grateful to have webinars like this to tune into several times a year. So thank you. Thank you. Um, my name's Dave Akmanowitz, obviously. I'm a PA Green. Uh, I'm an exiting school director in my community. Uh, in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. I uh, just completed a four-year term. I served as a past Green Party of Pennsylvania Secretary and Steering Committee member, and now uh, I'm currently serving once again as a Steering Committee member at large. Uh, over these uh, last years, I also had the pleasure of serving on several committees like the uh, Merchandise Committee, the Media Committee, as well as my state's uh, Communications Committee. Um, so, you know, run for office is a, is a whole experience. It's a, it could be a full-time job depending on the office. Um, we're going to talk today with some other office holders um, who have had some experience, some, some more than one race. Um, I think we're going to bring Anna on first. Uh, Anna, you want to join us? Hi. Hi. Good evening. Doing good. How's uh, the weather in Maine, I guess? Cold. Very cold. Yeah. <laughs> good. Hopefully not uh, as cold as the, the political climate uh, out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your candidacy. Tell me a little bit by why uh, you decided to run uh, and uh, a little bit about what it was like to run. Sure. So I just completed a race for city council district one in Portland, Maine. 
um, which is like half of the peninsula here in Portland. Um, I previously served on the school board for eight years before that. I was elected in 2013. And prior to that, I served on the Portland Charter Commission, which was a one year commission tasked with revising the city charter. Um, so I've had some experience in elected office now as a Green for almost a decade. And the district seat came open. Um, and I thought that it would be a good time if I, you know, ever wanted to serve on the council to go ahead and do it now. Um, I was interested in working on a broader range of issues and um, it was kind of a pivotal um, seat because it had the potential to sort of sway the majority on the council to a more um, progressive ideology. And that turned out to be the case. I was successful. Um, I um, I got, it was a two way race. Um, I earned 55% of the vote. Um, I had a number of things working against me, um, basically like the kind of establishment. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of the, the political spectrum in Portland kind of goes from, I would say like moderate Democrat to um, radical, progressive, or green. And um, and so the, the more sort of establishment um, elected officials kind of lined up and endorsed my opponent. Um, the local newspaper, the Press Herald, endorsed my opponent. Um, all of the developers in Portland contributed to my opponent. She outspent me by um, like twice as much, I think. Um, and so I basically knocked on doors. Um, I, I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. I wrote follow-up postcards to everybody that I had a conversation with. And um, at the end of the day, I think, you know, it was really sort of those one-on-one -on -one conversations that, um, that made it successful. Right, right. That personal contact, the knocking on doors, there's really nothing that substitutes for that. Um, you know, you, you worry so much about like buying signs and stuff, you know, because it's really important, you know, um, but signs don't vote. Right. Right. So, right. No There's so many time. aspects to a campaign that are um, important, you know, and you have to have them like signs and literature and everything. But it's really like the thing that um, that will really clinch it for you is the one on one contacts. Right. And they're likely to tell somebody, hey, you should vote for this person. And, uh, you know, that means a lot, especially. Uh, you know, coming from somebody, especially in this day and age. Exactly. Yeah. Um, first, I want to acknowledge uh, endorsement. Uh, you know, I noticed that you got the endorsement of your local fire company. And, uh, you know, yes. any endorsement is uh, pretty awesome to get an organization to stand with you. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. I thought that that was really wonderful doing some research in your candidacy. Any, yeah, I got the, um, that what's that? Can you tell us how that went down? Um, it, so it was the Portland Firefighters Union, um, and I got a couple of union endorsements. There was the um, the it was the um, regional laborers organization was the the other big one that I got. Um, you know, my um, predecessor on the council was kind of more in the moderate uh, conservative camp, and um, she had kind of you know, developed a reputation of not being particularly friendly <laughs> um, with these organizations. And um, she had endorsed my opponent. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I have developed relationships with um, the labor organizations, um, particularly also through my work on the school board. Um, you know, I had experience negotiating contracts um, and, you know, we on the school board actually developed um, as part of our sort of uh, our strategic plan, one of our core values was people. And so, you know, we were really um, valuing the fact that we have an organization that's made up of people and we need to value their work um, and provide for them. So I think, um, you know, having that reputation coming into it uh, versus kind of uh, what these organizations had come up against in the past, um, that combination of factors made them favorable to me. And so I was pleased to get those endorsements. I also got um, the endorsement of equity for Portland schools. Um, equity was a big issue that I talked about um, because 
on the school board, we had undergone racial justice training and really geared toward how um, internal bias affects our policy decisions as elected officials. Um, and so I talked a lot about developing policy through an equity lens um, when I joined the council. And that's actually something that I've talked with the city manager already about. And um, it looks like we're gonna be implementing some um, strategies toward that this year and undergoing similar training as a council. Thank you. Um, I, I wanna let everybody in the audience know if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you can post comments um, in the comment section, uh, questions in the comment section. And uh, we're gonna be getting to some of those questions later on today. Um, so please be sure to make sure you, you post your questions so that our guests can see them. Um, kind of going back uh, before we were talking about endorsements, back to your campaign. Um, do, did you have any particular challenges that you didn't expect when you were getting into this particular race for the office that you're in right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I talked about how the sort of establishment forces kind of lined up against me. And I, perhaps naively, um, I didn't expect that to happen. I thought that, you know, having served eight years on the school board where, you know, two, two of that time I was chair of the board, um, three years I had been chair of the finance committee. Um, so I had had opportunities to develop relationships with existing um, elected officials. I think, you know, there are a number of people that we recognize, maybe we're not on the same side of the political spectrum, but we work well together. Um, and goals. Developed a, right, we developed a, a decent relationship and um, certainly they understood that I had experience and um, and credentials and skills to bring to the table. And so I expected that maybe people would at least remain neutral <laughs> rather than kind of um, work against me. But I think ultimately people recognize that I um, do hold progressive values and that um, they were really afraid um, of that shift in the council, which um, did ultimately take place. Um, and, and even, in the two months that we've been um, in office since, that has proven to be the case. There's been a couple of issues um, that have been pivotal that probably would have gone a different way just, you know, a few months ago with the old council. <clears throat> so, like one of my other questions was kind of, you know, you being a, a minor party, you know, do you think that wet work for or against you? And and I guess you know the answer is both ways, both times, differently, right? You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think being a third party, there's, um, I mean, I think that that it's something that you do have to kind of overcome um, because people just don't, they don't understand it. They're a little afraid of it. Um, but to me, you know, I've always been a green and I've been um, in elected office now in the city for almost a decade. And so um, I, as a person, am sort of a um, known quantity. And I think um, my values have always been with the Green Party. And it's something that I've never, <laughs> I've never wanted to um, walk away from. And if anything, I hope that my candidacy and my presence in elected office um, helps further the cause and the goals of the Green Party. That's great news. I'm glad to hear such a thing. Um, I did have a, I see a question in the chat, I think is a pretty good one. It's uh, what would be the most valuable advice you could give from your experience as an elected Green for a first time Green candidate? Oh, gosh, there's so much. I mean, I would say um, that, you know, the it's I tend to follow tried and true campaign strategies. Um, it's the knock and doors, the conversations. Um, I would say go out and do that work, do that um, sort of ground campaign type of work. Um, you know, there every district is different. And here in Portland, I think we're at somewhat of an advantage because um, people are kind of more willing to elect Greens um, than in, you know, somewhere in rural Maine, for instance. It, it's really, really very challenging for a Green to be able to, you know, actually secure a seat like that. But, um, but 
even just the presence as a green as a candidate um, helps to kind of further um, our uh, issues and to um, give a green candidate personal experience. Um, and so I think it's a valuable experience, um, however, however you do it. <clears throat> Good. Um, was it hard for you to find campaign staff, maybe a campaign manager and or treasurer? What was your strategy on that? Was it easy to ask people within your party or did you go within your first circle? Yeah, um, so I I had a sort of a core team that developed and um, it sort of the early core team changed a little bit from what it kind of ended up being. I would kind of give a shout out to someone who I think is on here, um, Justin Beth. I know he's involved with the National Party and so some of you probably know him, but he lives here in my district um, just down the road and um, he was a huge asset to my campaign. Um, my partner actually is a state senator and um, he's run many campaigns, so he was very actively involved as well. Um, and then I had uh, a person doing all of my literature design um, who was just excellent and um, did that on a volunteer basis. I, I did end up um, paying him a stipend at the end because I was able to, but um, he did a lot more, <laughs> more work than I um, than I probably paid him for. So um, that was it, really. That was like, you know, my kind of core campaign team. So it was a small group of people doing some heavy lifting, but, um, but you know, we were kind of seasoned at the work that we do and we made it happen. A campaign is hard work, even the small ones, right? You know, um, yeah. going to judge of elections and auditor, people who want to feel comfortable about voting for you, that that one on one connection that putting the time in uh, is right. really, really important. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, in, in my race this year, the narrative that was spun kind of against me was um, we started calling it the divisive narrative. Um, you know, the, the kind of moderate camp was saying, oh, you know, the, these radical progressives, they're so divisive. Um, and um, and so I had to meet people one on one <laughs> to basically explain to them because it got out there and they said, oh, I'm concerned about divisiveness, you know, um, and and if you don't have that conversation, they don't know, you know, they they um, can easily cast you as something that you're not. Yeah, they, they trust what someone told them a lot of times. Right. Um, let's see, there was a question that was really good about maybe your two best fundraising strategies. I don't know if that's something that you wanted to touch on or not, maybe. Sure. Um, so I raised... I raised $11,000 for this campaign, which to me was like a, a lot. And I feel like um, for a district race in Portland, that's a lot, but it's kind of what, uh, you know, it, that's kind of like the average, um, you know, price of a campaign, I guess, these days. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know that I was going to be able to do that, but um, I called people, um, I called everybody that I like had in my phone. And um, I asked you know, for referrals to other people. I Facebook messaged people that I didn't have um, phone numbers for you. Probably some of you on here got Facebook <laughs> messages from me. Um, and I asked, you know, for whatever um, amount, it's always kind of hard to guess what you should ask for specifically, because, you know, you don't necessarily know um, what a particular person can afford. Um, but I, I would kind of, you know, sometimes give a range, you know, can you donate 25, 50 or $100, something like that. Um, and that way, it kind of gives them a, a choice. Um, and I had people contribute, the maximum contribution was $500. Um, so I did have several people that gave max contributions. Um, and then I had um, a number of people who gave uh, smaller contributions as well. Um, I will say that um, I did want to mention that the Green Party was overall very helpful to my campaign. A lot of the people who contributed throughout the country were Greens. A lot of people um, that contributed here in Maine were Greens and in Portland. 
Um, the state party contributed to my campaign directly and also contributed um, the use of a voter list and um, database that I could use so that I didn't have to make that purchase with um, my campaign dollars. There's sort of a limited number of ways that um, parties are allowed to directly help candidates and list resources is one of them. So, um, and Justin Beth, who was on my team, uh, managed the data for me. So um, both in terms of volunteers, uh, fundraising and um, resources, the, I would say the Green Party um, made a big, a big contribution to my campaign. Well, that's great news to hear, actually. You know, that's what we're trying to do, right? For one another, help each other. Um, you know, I, I oftentimes uh, remind people, you know, there's only a few hundred thousand of us all across the country. And just because a green might not be in our state doesn't mean they can't use our help. If you're if you're out there and you're and you're looking for a green to help and you, you might not be able to find one in your state, um, there's plenty of greens out there. You know, uh, we all need to support one another and, and help our party grow. Um, yes. One of the ways that we're, we're hoping that's going to happen, I think, is there's a, there's a lot of support from Greens out there behind ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really hoping that before we got off the call, I, I know you have to go soon uh, before we speak with Peter. Um, but I was hoping maybe you could touch on ranked choice voting and how it works there in Maine a little bit. Just touch on it for everybody not to get too boring. We don't want people, you know, but absolutely. And, and um, tell us a little bit about it, your experience with it and um, um, maybe your role with it. Yeah. Ranked choice voting is... Um, you know, it's a huge issue for Greens. We've had it on our platform for many, many, many years. Um, and it's kind of only recently sort of gaining foothold in particular areas in the country. Um, and Portland is one of those places. Back in 2009, I served as a charter commissioner. Um, and so in that role, we looked at the city charter. Uh, it was a group of 12 of us, nine of us were elected. Um, and we made recommendations to, you know, make amendments to the city charter. Um, one of those amendments that I, I actually proposed um, with one of my colleagues was um, ranked choice voting for um, the mayoral race. Um, because at the time we were making the change also from an elect, from a, an appointed mayor to an elected mayor. Um, and we, started off proposing it for all municipal races, but um, the, you know, the range of people that we had to work with on a 12 member commission um, just wasn't quite there yet. <laughs> and so they, um, they were, we were able to come around to, to the idea that, um, well, let's try it for the mayor's race. Um, we expected that the mayor's race was going to be highly competitive. Um, and we really sold the idea to our colleagues that this was a way to ensure the majority sentiment of the electorate prevailed um, in that vote. So, um, you know, we were up against some sort of outside organizations that were lobbying and trying to create confusion around how this worked and trying to claim that, you know, other places in the country that had tried it, um, it didn't work. and. Um, just trying to sow confusion to um, thwart the efforts of ranked choice voting. But um, we worked through that. It was really kind of an educational process, kind of getting our colleagues along with it. Um, and we were ultimately successful in making that proposal to the voters, which ultimately was ratified um, by the voters. Um, so we had our first experience electing a mayor through ranked choice voting in, God, it would have been 20. I can't remember, 11, 11, I think. And um, it seemed to go well. People seemed to like it. People became accustomed to it pretty quickly. Um, and since then, the state has implemented ranked choice voting, um, unfortunately not for state races because, um, because there's a conflict in the language of the uh, state constitution, but um, for all other races, so like the congressional races have ranked choice voting. And um, the city council just, I think last year actually expanded ranked choice voting to all municipal races. So um, technically my race last time around would have been ranked choice voting if there had been more than two candidates um, and all other races in which there were more than two candidates last year were ranked choice voting. So. 
it was pretty cool and it seems to be working well. well I'm glad you got elected, but a little bit bittersweet that you didn't get to utilize the ranked choice voting as it was intended to get elected, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, one last thing before we go, I guess, if you don't have anything you want to add at the end, I, I, I wanted to ask both you and Pete if you guys have any really funny or really great inspiring stories from on the campaign trail or most specifically on election night or the next day um, that you can share with everybody. Uh, I think, you know, my election night in particular was not all that um, eventful because I, I had to work the next morning. And so I, I, <laughs> so did I. I just went home. <laughs> Um, but, um, but, you know, I would say the one thing that was really cool on, on the campaign trail, the, of course I had come from the school board. So this was particularly, um, fun for me. Um, there was a group of middle school students who held a debate for us and we participated in their debate, but they, they had a whole curriculum around this election and they did like a mock election and they campaigned for different candidates. And um, after, you know, after everything was said and done and I, I had been, you know, sworn in and everything, um, a few weeks later, uh, a package arrived in the mail to me, which was um, the posters and banners and campaign materials that this middle school class had made supporting my candidacy. Um, and they, they had a card in it, you know, saying how, how happy they were that I had been elected and stuff. It was, it was really cool. That is actually a really great story, and it would have saved your friend a whole lot of time, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great story. Thank you. Um, anything else you'd like to add before we part? I don't think so. I um, Again, I appreciate you having me on tonight. I appreciate all the support that the Green Party has given um, for my candidacy, and um, and yeah, I look I look forward to um, you know continuing these conversations, helping out in any way that I can. Well, thanks for helping us continue in uh, the good green fight. Yeah, thank you. You take care. Uh, Peter, are you standing by? Yes, I'm here. Oh, oh, good, waiting and willing. Great, great. I thought it was going to take you more time to pop up there. And I was going to make a smooth segue and remind everybody to post their questions in chat. Uh, we can see them if you're on the YouTube channel and uh, uh, make sure that you post some questions for Peter. Um, I also want to just kind of get a drop in there for gp.org. If you have an opportunity to uh, check out the website, we have some great press releases there as well as the, the Green Party store. Um, Peter, you are our mayor. Yes, that, that, yes, that's what they tell me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations uh, on getting elected. How, how long have you been a mayor now? Uh, I think we're pushing nine months. Um, All right. I was elected in April and uh, took office in May. And I had previously served on the Galesburg City Council for 10 years. April and May. So uh, was that a special election of some kind? No, we hold our local elections in April. Um, okay. And, and we do, we have seven councilors, city councilors and a mayor. Uh, and so we, 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 that's eight people. So we have four of those elections every other year. So as mayor, um, I want to say, like, tell me about your day to day, but I really don't want to get into that. Uh, tell me about the experience of being mayor and the team, you know, as a green, you know, we have to work with other people. So, yeah. So, well, I just want to, I, I mean, I think it's really important to really recognize and I, I assume Anna it was pretty clear, but not explicit. I mean, she ran as a green party candidate. Uh, I did not and not. It, we had a nonpartisan election, so um, and that's been true in all the elections. I've won, I think, four elections now, and all of them have been nonpartisan. Um, that's just how we do things in our city. Uh, that being said, I mean, I I certainly feel I've been a member of the, the Illinois Green Party for quite a long time. I've been associated ideologically with the Greens uh, for most of my adult life. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, in terms of building team. I mean, the other thing that's really remarkable about my election wasn't, I mean, not me, but the fact that I was the one progressive voice on a city council of six others and, and an oppositional mayor. And yet 
uh, that didn't um, that didn't deter me. Um, I, I I'm an internal optimist. I'm an environmental science professor, and so you can imagine day to day I I listen to uh, things like "Don't Look Up" on a routine basis, <laughs> and and that has hardened my skin, but also um, created a, a worldview that I have and I live by every day. You know, I really truly believe the world can be a better place. We just have to want it. To be that way and so that led me to run for what was a going to be a, a very contested race for sure and and many people even close friends didn't think i could win um and and even those that thought well maybe you could win possibly but even if you do win you're going to have an extremely oppositional city council and so you're not going to get anything done so why bother and i guess i would uh say that sitting here nine months later um, not only did I get elected, uh, but I also, the council has shifted considerably. Two new council members were elected at the same time, uh, and two new uh, council people were uh, able to be appointed by me with, with the approval of the council. And so now we have four new councilors. And so the whole complexion of the city council in Galesburg has changed dramatically in, the, in that time. And uh, it's, it's really exciting. Uh, really exciting to be in kind of that situation, but one of the one of the things I heard from some people in the community community were, well, if you get elected, it's going to be very contentious. And I said, why do you think that? Well, you you think differently than most of the others in the council. I said, that's fine. I said, um, but we live in the same community. We we breathe the same air. Uh, we have to resolve a lot of the challenges we have, and there's incredible opportunities for us. So, uh, and as a mayor, and I should also be clear, the mayor in Galesburg is, is it's a, what's called a soft mayor or weak mayor. Uh, that is, we have a, a manager council form of government. So the mayor doesn't vote unless there's a tie, and the mayor is, is a part-time individual. I'm still uh, basically a full-time professor while I'm being a mayor. So the city manager is the person in charge of all the 200 plus employees we have. So what does that all mean? That means that in order for the, what is the role of the mayor? I understood being on the council for 10 years, the role of the mayor is to create teamwork, create collaboration, create opportunities. Um, I think what in our political divide we have in this country right now is, 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 you know, uh, fed to us daily by every, um, media source, pretty much every media source we want. I mean, they, they feed on our frenzy of antagonism and, and disgust and despair. And that's really sad, right? That's terribly sad. But um, at the basic level, you know, people in my community want the same things, right? They want to live in a safe community. They want to have things for their kids to do. Uh, they want to be able to walk and feel, you know, feel happy and, and comfortable with their neighbors. They want to know their neighbors. They want to engage in the arts and music and athletics and recreation. I mean, these are all things we want. They want to drink clean water. They want to, they want to breathe clean air. I mean, these are, these are human things. And, and I think uh, a lot of my campaign was around those things. What is common to us? What can we do? And as a person who'd been on the council for 10 years, uh, having looked at many budgets and realizing that it wasn't that we don't have the money. It's a question of how we prioritize uh, what we want to do collectively so that we can all benefit. Understood. I think that is uh, the most important thing. And, and, and you were talking about earlier, it's the common goal for most of us to want to prosper and be comfortable and be safe. And, and even our political not allies, it's theirs too. And so there's lots of common ground and there is a culture of divisiveness where people profit from our divisiveness uh, with one another, I think. And so I, I could uh, you know, agree with you there. <sighs> so it sounds like you've been elected for a little while now to some capacity, you've been serving your community locally. Um, what motivated you to step up and say, you know what, I, I wanna serve locally? Well, initially, this goes back 11 years now, um, I had, had, it's a very interesting story, I'll keep it very brief, but uh, in my teachings, I was able to, I teach a course called Environmental Racism with a colleague, and we, we took a trip to Chicago, which is about three hours from here, 
we met with a um, a environmental justice group there, Levejo, L-V-E-J-O, and walking through the streets of Chicago in the early 2000s and seeing a, um, a community where, you know, the majority of the people there uh, are young, um, working multiple jobs, uh, speaking Spanish as a primary language, yet they were able to do some incredibly fascinating things for them for their for themselves and for the community as a whole and so i was really enthused by that so when i came back to galesburg uh after that field trip and also i volunteered there during a sabbatical that i had um i realized well why can't we have it in our community you know we we have we have similar similar uh needs we have a similar community of people uh and why can't we organize so i in fact invited 10 members of uh my, my kind of my larger community groups. And because I felt like we could, we could have them in elected office, but maybe they didn't have the, the, the uh, kind of the confidence or the willingness, uh, you know, the fortitude just to step up because it takes a lot. And one of my messages tonight is to tell you that, you know, I'm, it's great to see, I see people typing in that they're going to run and that's fantastic. But sometimes you can play a major role by encouraging someone else to run and, and being their support because it take in our current environment right now. I mean, a lot of people even ask me, well, why would you run? It's just you're going to you want to be on the plane when it crashes. I mean, you want to be the, the pilot. And I'm like, no, I say that's the wrong attitude. So I <clears throat> right. completely say we're not going to crash this plane uh, anyway. The point is, I brought 10 people into my house and I tried to encourage each one of them to run. And I said, I would support any one of them to run. And then when they left and a week later, they each of them told me in different ways they couldn't do it. They had family commitments. They were they had they, you know, they were busy. Um, they were old, you know, whatever it might have been. And I so I looked in the mirror and I said, well, I guess I have to run. So that was my initial uh, attempt. And so and I did many of the same things Anna has done. And I fully support her her tactics you have you have to go door to door you have to make that uh one-on-one -on -one contact and in a, in a in a municipal and especially a smaller city and a city is bigger than galesburg but in a smaller cities i mean you can knock on a lot of doors if you put your mind to it and your your and your supporters can do that too and it means a lot right um yeah. particularly in our current you know covid environment and i mean it was bad before then but it's, it's in some ways worse now we're so closed in you know, we're, we're afraid of our neighbors in some regard. I think in some communities that's been improved through COVID. But nonetheless, it really does change the politic. You know, we're so used to watching the politic perform on television, almost like a soap opera. But when you actually see the politics, I had people, they say, you're, you're Peter? Yeah, I'm Peter. I mean, I had a mask on. Obviously, it was cold. I had a hat on. So people didn't necessarily know it was me. And, uh, you know, I had a big button. I said, you know, you got to think big. So this is about as big as my face. So you want to make sure you have a big button to uh, as, a, as a sign of confidence, but also as a sign of, of, of changing mindset. You know, I think we do need to think big. We can talk about that in a little bit. But I ran because I felt like um, we need to change the status quo. The status quo is so boring. The status quo is obviously heading off the cliff in so many areas of our existence, and we need people to step up and, and people who have a different vision. I, I don't feel like I have all the answers to anything, frankly, but I feel like we need people with the capacity to listen and to try to translate in that in those those thoughts from other people, those dreams into actual um, realities. And that's, to me, a really important thing that we all can do, whether we're elected or not. I, I can tell you, uh, and I'll just use myself as an example. You know, the first 12 years I lived in Galesburg, um, I may have gone to two council meetings. And now I'm sitting as a mayor, and I love when the community comes and tells me what's on their mind. I think that's, a, that's part of democracy, participatory democracy. It requires us to go to council meetings and speak up. And, you know, how many people are going to speak up in a typical municipal council meeting? Five? Ten? Yeah. So... Just imagine the voice that Greens can have if they took on that responsibility as a collective, that they would go to council meetings and speak about uh, ranked choice voting, 
for instance. No one has come to our city council meetings talking about that. That would be a great contribution. Um, but the list goes on. You know, the list goes on or the tops, you know, the topics we could write encyclopedia books of topics that are relevant to everyday people. And when someone speaks the truth, you don't have to be a member of a party, right? You're just a human being living in your community and people are going to listen and say, hmm, that's interesting. What did that person have to say? I feel the same way. You know, I feel like our community can do this or can do that. Why are we not doing this or that? And I think that's really important. So I am, uh, we need greens. I'm going to read a question here from chat. Sure. We'll kind of get off onto that. And then in a, in a minute, we're going to go back to, I'm going to ask you if you have um, any advice for greens that may be thinking of running for office. You, you've done a lot of inspiring so far, I think, because I think you've done a great job at pointing out how we can really make a difference um, from our from our position. Um, so we'll come back to that. Uh, we need greens involved in our local environmental commission. Green teams, shade tree commissions, planning and zoning boards. Some of these positions you can just join and build your name while others are appointed by the mayor of the town. All right, I expected to read a, um, a question, I apologize. Well, I think- I I Answer my, my question that. that I had before then. <laughs> If you, if you have nothing to add there. Well, no, I think I think uh, I think Helen wrote that. I mean, I think that's a, a really important point. Uh, or oh, Holly, sorry. So that that is true. One of the, one of the roles I do play is I get to um, uh, nominate people to commissions. We have about ten commissions at the city of Galesburg, and we can create new commissions. Uh, there's talk about creating a housing commission. Uh, there's there's a talk about talking about a park commission. We have we have a golf commission. We have a trees commission but we don't have a park commission and so there's other things we have and our youth commission let me just give you an example we had a youth commission that was pretty inactive and it consisted mostly i mean it, it had about five to six uh older members of the community running it okay well the council reviewed this and said no we need youth voice we want to hear what the youth think in our community so they created a a, a body a new co youth commission with new new uh, authorities and, and responsibilities. It has 11 members, seven of whom are below the age of 18, 18 and under, seven, the majority. And I can tell you at the last meeting, the first meeting, they anointed or appointed a co two co-chairs to that youth commission. And I believe they're both 14 years old. So I, I think that is incredible. That's incredible in terms of partic participatory democracy. Right. Uh, and I love it. I'm, and that's the council. The council was given the test. I didn't, I had, I thought I, I had hope of maybe having one young person kind of appointed as kind of a, a junior council person. And they took that idea, which was obviously not big enough and not um, comprehensive enough and not as uh, aggressive enough. And they said, let's, let's revamp the whole thing. And I was like, really? So, yeah. Again, I think the seeds are there, okay? The seeds are there in our community, respective communities to do exactly what um, Holly's saying. Um, and, and so we can get involved, right? My key advice to any green person is to get involved in the community in some way. In, 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 in fact, in almost every way possible if you can coach coach if you can if you're an arborist plant trees if you don't know how to plant trees then go find out how to do it with an arborist or or a local community garden or join some nonprofit boards just get involved and then you get to meet different people and then they look at you and they say what what part are you a part of are you you know associated with i'm well i'm green and they're like what what's a green well that's the way it is say in galesburg but you know in other parts of the country it, it's it's we wear green, but in terms of how we function in community, we're just a member of the community. That's what we are, first and foremost. Yeah. And, and I, being green is more than just a T-shirt sometimes. Yes, it really is. And, you know, I know a lot of green people feel uh, oppressed by the mainstream media, right? We don't even get acknowledgement that we exist, right? Um, and that's, 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 traumatizing and, and belittling and, and defeating and all this other stuff. But in reality, 
uh, that's why we have to be our own press. I noticed someone said, you know, use social media. Yeah, we have to use it. This forum in and of itself, right? This is a great way to get the word out. Um, we're not aliens, right? We're, we live, we're all human beings. We live on earth. So, and we're, we're each profession. Most of us, you know, have careers and families, just like everybody else. You know, we're not some foreign entity that like some submariner that came out of the bottom of the ocean and wants to, you know, like the, the Marvel comic strips, you know, that's not what the green people are about, right? The green people are about just living harmoniously and not accepting the status quo, not accepting things as they are, which basically means, and COVID has only exacerbated this, yeah. that the wealth is continually concentrated higher and higher up. And it's, it's, and we wonder why people are um, struggling. I mean, struggling to survive. I, I experienced this social media, you know, Democrats were blaming a Republican, a Republican was blaming a Democrat for like the last three years, you know what I mean? And he, he, I just said, hey, wait a minute, you know, we've been, you know, kind of on a downward slide for 30 years. This just kind of exacerbated it a little bit, you know, like, you know, you're both the people that were in charge of getting us here, you know? So, so, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the culture of, um, um, watching them too, from our perspective, fight amongst themselves. And you're just like, you know, and uh, as greens, you know, one of the challenges that I have is trying to find the nicest way to say that, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, you have any advice for me? Uh, you know, I'm, I, I, yeah, I, I try to avoid giving, I, I have students as advisees and I, I give very tempered advice most of the time. I so, say, you know, I, I literally say, look inside yourself, you know, follow what's true to you. And it'll probably be the right course. You know, I, I do want to take a moment and uh, give Craig C from uh, New Jersey, I believe, uh, proper credit for for that question with regards to the um, the, the boards and committees and such. Okay. Um, you know, serving on school board, uh, I had the pleasure of serving on uh, my sub uh, several subcommittees. And one of those subcommittees was the tech school. Um, do you guys uh, in your town have any sort of a tech school for your district? And uh, what is your opinion of that? And are you involved at all? In when you your, say your like position? you're talking about like, like technology? Yes, technology center, like yeah. a high school technology center. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, yeah. alternative yeah. to college would have been the sentiment at one point. Right. So Galesburg has 30,000 residents and we have two colleges, one where I work, the Knox College, and then we have a community college as well. Um, and we have one major high school where everyone goes. And it looks like we're, and very soon we're going to have one major junior high school. We had two junior high schools. And, I'm, you know, we have some, obviously some smaller private schools as well. Uh, within the main high school, there's been a lot of changes. Uh, the school board has had tremendous impact uh, in, in moving us forward, trying to le le level the playing field for all. So everyone in Galesburg will get the same quality, high quality education. And, you know, I, I give it give the school board and the superintendent a lot of credit there for doing that, for, for dreaming big and making things happen and looking out for everyone, not just the select few. Um, we don't have, we have, um, you know, we're very concerned about employment for our young people once they graduate high school. Most of them are not going to go directly to college. And so we, we, there has been a major investment in, in, uh, you know, uh, skill-based learning uh, technological center that just opened up where it was, it was open, but it has been moved across the street and really expanded. I'm trying to make connections with local, uh, industrial lists and so forth to try to, uh, give them the training they need so they can be employed. Uh, we've seen a big boom in, uh, solar, uh, energy in our state, which you may know about. And I'm a big proponent of solar. I'm a, also a science researcher and publisher on the topic and and try to do my best to encourage solar in Galesburg and surrounding areas uh, just to give people some I know many people on the call are probably pro solar there's going to be a solar array that's built just south of the city uh, which is going to be about 400 acres in size that's about 400 football fields and it will actually provide enough energy electricity to power every home in the city of Galesburg 30,000 people now I will say the city didn't have much to do with that, why that occurred, and the city isn't the recipient of that energy directly. Um, but it sets the stage 
for that to occur. And um, in the you know near future, I hope all of us will be powered by pr primarily solar fields uh, in and around our our cities. Right, right. There's a uh, lots of lessons we can take from uh, uh, Japan uh, with regards to the way that they've uh, used their their solar panels in certain ways. Uh, along certain paths and stuff that's beneficial for most people, walking paths and such. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really great question that I'd like to drop on you, I guess, from Craig once again. Uh, he's on a roll. Um, Mayor Schwartzman, uh, what challenges did you face running for office during the pandemic? Were you able to enact or influence any protocols that might not possibly happened if you weren't the mayor? Well, it's, I'm trying to read the question to see if the pandemic is the is the is the primary piece of information here that I'm, I'm pivoting on or not. Um, so I'll try to answer it, and and more than happy to to talk with anybody beyond this or follow up. So it sounds like he's asking for your strategy with the pandemic. If I yeah, well, I mean, okay. First of all, I had to get signatures, and in Galesburg, we had to get about 250 to 300 signatures. And that was in, uh, in our case, that would have been in um, January, February, March of 2021, right? And so that would have been a time when vaccines were just getting off, you know, just getting offered to, especially to people my age. But uh, it was an early, early stage. Most of the people were not vaccinated. Um, so to get signatures... You know, I felt very uncomfortable. Uh, I had many volunteers willing to go door to door, but I felt very comfortable doing that. And so what I did was I set up a, a booth basically outside my house and I asked people to come by and sign it. And they and I didn't get all Great 300 time. that way, but I got probably 100 that way. And that 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 eased the burden a bit. So that was one thing that was that I tried um, in terms of going door to door during the pandemic as well. I mean, I uh, wore a mask. Uh, most people respected me for that. And and everyone who walked with me would, would wear a mask. Uh, we kept our distance. Um, another thing we did, I did weekly Zooms on important topics in the community. I would I would say that's a great way to uh, to connect. Uh, not everybody has access to Zoom, admittedly, um, but a lot of people do, and increasing numbers will. will. And so I think Zooms are a great way to meet people, uh, particularly during the pandemic. And also the topics, you can you can change a topic every week and make it really relevant to what's going on in your community. And and that's where, in fact, other people can meet each other. You know, you go to our door, everybody meets you, but they don't necessarily meet each other. So a Zoom... Um, allows that to happen. Now, hopefully, post-pandemic, you know, the Zooms can be large community forums, uh, um, social events outside with music, with food, you know, these kinds of things. I hope to certainly encourage that in, in, in our community as, as we move forward. The second part of the question about what would happen, what, you know, what kind of protocols existed with the, perhaps be, what, that wouldn't happen if I was the mayor, um, you know, that's a good question. Uh, part of it, uh, again, I, I'm sort of a weak mayor, so I can't just say, okay, everyone has to wear a mask or, you know, this kind of thing. Um, I've been working with the city manager. I mean, he understands, you know, from the get-go, I worked with him prior to being elected as mayor, that, that uh, you know, I'm more, I'm more oriented towards science and safety. Uh, I think we've, we've been doing vaccine, uh, vaccination drives at City Hall. Uh, and we've been supportive of vaccination drives in other areas of our community. Um, I give the fire chief a lot of credit for working on that. Uh, and so I think there was kind of a recognition that as being a scientist mayor, that we would be following scientific protocols uh, and, and uh, information as, as, and being keeping abreast of that as much as possible. I think that did, there was a sea change in, in thinking on that. So, you know, there's just one or two other things that I think that I'd like to ask you before we, um, you know, wrap up, you know, more strategic and, and um, you know, campaign based, you know, did you by any chance um, have a treasurer for your campaign and were you able to maybe average out cost per vote or something like that? Uh, and tell me a little bit about building your team 
when you decided you wanted to run, how, how all that came together? And well, th th that was a challenge. I mean, uh, when I ran for city council three times, I, I mean, I got some con contributions from friends and family and maybe a few, you know, and I had to, I ponied up a little bit of money of my own. Um, but those campaigns were done with for less than a thousand dollars. And so that was, you know, fairly easily done. When I was running for mayor, I realized, well, I, you know, I have to spend more than a thousand dollars and I'm not wealthy by any stretch. So, you know, I had to go out and ask. And that was one of the hardest things. In fact, I, I didn't even have a cell. I never did not own a cell phone until I ran my campaign. I had I, I didn't want to have a cell phone ever. And I had to sacrifice that. And now it's kind of like it's almost, you know, intravenous, which is why I didn't want to have one in the first place. But um, but I had to get a phone because I had to make calls. As Anna pointed out earlier, I mean, you have to make calls. And I, I don't like making calls asking for money. Uh, and it's just a personal issue. But I know a lot of people have that same feeling. Um, yeah. Because part of the issue is when you ask them for money, you you don't know someone's circumstance. You know, there's an assumption. Oh, they drive a nice car. They live in a big house or but you don't know anything about that person, really. You don't know what, maybe they've had some health crises. Maybe their family members have had health crises. Maybe they've had, uh, you know, student debt, which is astronomical, as we know, blah, blah, blah. So to ask someone for money is is was not easy for me. But but I, I kind of, through practicing with the team, I learned that I had to translate how I was interpreting that. I, I had to think of it like if a close friend of mine called me and said, look, I need, I need, can you give me 25 bucks, 50 bucks? I'm running for this office and I'm really going to speak the truth and I'm going to try to change the lives of our community. I would be like, yes, right. where can I donate? Like, can I drive it over right now? And right. so I had to change the response. So the point was, I had no expectations that people would give me anything, but I, but I did feel like uh, I needed it. And if they could offer it, then I was much, I knew it was going to go in a good place. It was going to be, it was going to be well utilized. And so that gave me a certain confidence that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, the, I mean, I will tell you my, the mayoral uh, cost was about $15,000 to run. Uh, I'm sure my, a two-time incumbent who ran against me spent three times that, if not more. Um, but it didn't didn't work. <laughs> um, and you know, there, we could talk about why, but um, clearly, I went door to door, and that's not something he had ever done. Um, I think people want change. I think that's really important. Something the Green Party brings to the table, uh, not just like in the moment, but historically. Historically, we have a track record that goes back several decades where we have been the champions of causes that have now become kind of the the um, the standard understanding of things. Right. Yeah. And I think we should we should own that and we should project that uh, we're, we've been consistent about, um, you know, wanting to do something about climate change, want to do something about social justice want to do something about gender equity. You know, these are real, these are our core values. You, you can go to, we have 10 core values that I think we all should almost know the back of our hand. And those core values need to be repeated to our, to everyday people. And then we ask, you know, other politicians might talk about these things, but then when they're put in position to do anything about them, then they, you know, they get squeaky, right? They Usually get lean to the side of their donors. Right. And, and so, you know, I think um, back to the Treasury issue. Oh, I should also say I had some uh, overage in my account and I was able to donate that to the public library and able to support a history of Galesburg project uh, that is still going on. And um, we hope to have that the, the, the fruits of that project. Uh, revealed manifest in our new public library and, and that go that will be open in about a year and what i, well, I want to put i want to put a, a highlight on this point there are so many things in communities that are being ignored and being overlooked 
and and greens have to be like open-minded and thoughtful and one one area is inclusive histories does your community does your city have an inclusive history because i can tell you that going through galesburg's inclusive history there are a lot of wonderful things we can point to there are obviously bad things as well but when we start to tell a history that t shows how every member of every ethnicity every race every gender and such contributed to the betterment of this community over time uh we have something that we all can take you know feel proud of pride is important in a community and i think we need to we need to foster that i, I think it's a really great project to highlight the, the diversity and the effect that it had over time and uh, i think there's something especially in smaller communities that uh can be taken away from that because um you know Sometimes smaller communities are less diverse, so. Right, and you know, there's there are some obviously communities where they had horror, you know, they had horror in their in their communities. So did they just sweep it under the rug and assume that it just it went away and no one's ever gonna look at it? No, I think we have to, you know, Tulsa is a good example of the challenges faced when you have to look at your history squarely in the face and how you're gonna deal with it and how you're gonna project in the future and how you're gonna teach the young people like what, most people that grew up in Galesburg, you know, I grew up in a, in a large city on the East Coast, right? Uh, so uh, a, a large, uh, smaller cities, um, a lot of the kids that they grew up from birth through high school, and many of them never even left. This is where they live. This is their life. This is their entire world experience. So in order for them to understand their place, and they're and you know to have pride and recognition of where they come from i think is really important as we you know we challenge ourselves to work together you know the, one of the other principles of green thinking is this idea of thinking globally but also being very practical and pragmatic about what you do where you live make right it on. meaningful there what a great place to wrap up for us peter thank you so much for uh uh, talking with us today. We really, really appreciate it. Lots of great insight. Um, one or two things that you said, you know, my experience running for office, I, my, my biggest fear is the asking for money part as well. And, and you know, the, the advice that I think uh, that many candidates or prospective candidates can take away from this is your best resource is your friends and family. These are the people you're going to, you shouldn't be afraid of asking your friends and family because they'll be the ones that are the, that are going to help get you started. They're the ones that are going to inspire you and hopefully support you. And don't be afraid to ask the aunts and the uncles and the brothers and sisters, hey, Aunt X, I'm running for office, you know, support your your favorite, uh, you know, um, nephew with a $50 donation or whatever. Um, we really need to not be afraid to ask for money. And it's really hard in this day and age. Um, you know, like most people, many greens struggle. And, uh, you know, you're asking for people that are already having money problems for money. And, uh, you know, in exchange, like you said, I want to give you my money, but tell me why. Right. And uh, if you do that, your friends and family will support you. And so I want to encourage anybody out there running. If that is your biggest hang up, don't let it be your biggest hang up. Um, if you're thinking of running a campaign with no money, you should still do it. Get the practice run a campaign with no money. There's so much stuff that you need to learn. So um, th there's going to be nothing bad to come from it. Um, any closing thoughts before I give one final plug to the CCC and the Green Party store? No, I, I'm, I'm so glad to have done this with you guys. Thanks, Dave, Holly, Michael, all, all the people behind the scene. And then also, you know, all the all, I see all the comments. I'm trying to read them. I'm very intrigued and interested. I, I recognize they're going to be on Facebook too, so I'll get a chance to look at them. I'm happy to, if any of you are thinking of running or want some, you know, more one-on-one -on -one time with me. Uh, please just reach out to me on Facebook. Also, my my you know the email, and I'd love to chat with you more. I think it, it's it's great to feel the love that you know goes beyond the the city limits of Galesburg. Right. Right. The green, the faraway green hugs from one another. It's a great thing. Uh, thank you very much, Pete. You be safe. Um, 
thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I hope that you found this informative and maybe a little bit inspiring. Uh, do your research in your state, reach out to your state party. Hopefully you'll be able to meet up with some people in the chat from your state that you haven't met yet. And uh, I would inspire you all to re, uh, explore the resources from the uh, CCC there at gp.org forward slash CCC. All the, the training videos over the years that they have are available for all of us. Um, and please be seen being green out there. Uh, you can get Green Party shirts and buttons and, and lots of free downloads for campaigning and tabling uh, at gp.org forward slash store. Thank you all so much. Be safe out there. Wash your hands. Take care.